to quote from the Rigveda, Ano Bhadra Kratavo Yantu Vishwataha, meaning let noble thoughts come to me from all sides. Today, we are honored to have a very distinguished scholar and genome biologist, Professor Madan Tangavelu, joining us from University of Cambridge, England. He will be speaking on the language paradox in globalizing Ayurveda and Ayush. Many renowned scholars have joined us in this knowledge quest today. I request Professor J.S.R. Prasad, head of the Department of Sanskrit Studies, to deliver the welcome address. Namaskarve Bhyaha. Very good evening to all the participants who join by I'm sorry, uh, there was small problem. Yeah. Uh, I know Professor Madanji for more uh, than a decade. Uh, we have been uh, communicating with each other uh, through emails earlier. Once it so happened that uh, uh, I met him in uh, Riga, Europe, uh, in a conference, University of Riga. There was a conference in which our university has uh, collaborated with the Ayurvedic Center, uh, University of Latvia. So this is where uh, so many things have been discussed. I was very enthusiastic to learn from him uh, the scientific uh, uh, dimensions of uh, Ayurveda. Because he's a uh, scientist who is deeply interested in uh, Indian uh, philosophy, culture, and in Indian medical science called Ayurveda. So I, I was uh, highly attracted to his ideas. One so happened that he even uh, suggested me to conduct uh, a workshop on Ayurvedic etymologies. Because we Sanskritists uh, uh, have a control over the uh, etymological meanings of uh, the Ayurvedic terminologies. Because uh, the words, uh, very words like vata, pitta, and kapha, when they are translated, they are only approximate uh, in, in, in any other foreign language. They cannot convey the actual uh, conceptual meaning. Uh, th there is a, they are uh, impregnated with philosophies, these uh, terminologies, sir. Such a way, he has a specific idea about language. So today, I think uh, we are going to listen to all those ideas. Uh, from Professor uh, Madanji. Uh, I first of all thank him for accepting our invitation to join uh, this online lecture series called Tadvidya Sambhasha. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, the Tadvidya Sambhasha lecture series is aimed to help young research and the researchers and the teachers uh, to gather ideas. Uh, for their uh, teaching or research uh, from the experts. That with the Sambhasha means uh, dialogue with the expert. So, uh, 24th of uh, uh, February, uh, sorry, January, we have uh, inaugurated the lecture series. Professor K. Muthulakshmi has uh, delivered the inaugural lecture, the connections between the Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, and Ayurveda. That was the initial lecture. And this is the second lecture in the series. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Murali, sir. Uh, he is uh, uh, the son of uh, Padma Bhushan, uh, Dr. Rakhun Tirumal Pad, sir. And uh, Dr. N. Anjanay Murthy ji, uh, an eminent scholar in Ayurveda in India. I, I've only heard about him. I am lucky to have him uh, here today. And uh, uh, my own colleagues, uh, Professor Amba Kulkarni ji, and uh, Professor Aloka Parashar Senji. Also, I'm seeing uh, Anant Murtiji uh, in the audience. And uh, Dr. G.B. Kerao, uh, CMD of uh, Prakati Biopharma and uh, Prakati Research Hyderabad. And uh, many others, our own uh, students, research scholars, and others who join today to this wonderful lecture, which is very few words. Uh, once again, I welcome you all uh, to the lecture by Dr. Madan Tangaveluji. Thank you all. Namaste. Thank you, sir. 
I now request Ms. S. K. Abhirami, fourth semester MA Sanskrit student at the department, to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Madan Tangavelu. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, this task of introducing our guest of honor and speaker, Professor Madan Tangavel, is a great privilege. Professor Madan Tangavel is a genome biologist based in Cambridge with an unusually diverse academic background and a range of research interests. He was born in 1959 in Trivandrum in the state of Kerala. Before Cambridge, he studied agriculture and has a bachelor's degree in agriculture and a master's in plant breeding and genetics, both from Haryana Agricultural University. As an INLAX Foundation scholar, his PhD in molecular genetics on the genes for the psychoskeletal protein action was conducted at the erstwhile Plant Breeding Institute, Rumpington, Cambridge. It the study provided the first evidence for extensive tissue level expression of members of the very large family of action genes in plants. His postdoctoral research experiences spans areas in plants, fungal, bacterial, and human cancer genomics. His current primary research interest is the development of single DNA molecule and single cell techniques for genome analysis. The techniques also point to uncertainty in biology, which calls for complementary approaches for appreciating human health and diseases, particularly in the higher, highly intractable areas of human aging, psychosomatic disease complexes, where direct approaches are unlikely to yield result. He is the General Secretary Board Member and Research Director of the European Ayurvedic Association. Professor Madan is a member of the team of the experts under Pandit Madan Mohan Malaviya National Mission, Ministry of Human Resource Development, Government of India. He is also the member of Mind Matter Unification Project at the Cavendish Laboratory, University of Cambridge, and an honorary adjunct professor at the University of Transdisciplinary Health Sciences and Technology. He is a former trustee of the Research Council of Complementary Medicine. On a final note, I would like to welcome Professor Madan Tangavelu, and we are grateful for his presence among us today. Thank you. Thank you, Abhirami, for the excellent introduction. We have been looking forward to your lecture, sir, for a long time now. I request you to kindly present your lecture. Vinayaji, thank you. Thank you very much for having me with all of you today. Um, as uh, your head of department, Prasadji, just mentioned, I've interacted with uh, Prasadji for some time now, and we met at a meeting at uh, in Riga in Latvia. This was almost eight or nine years ago. And there was something there, a dialogue that got started, and it's matured over the years to where it is today. And my question then was, to Prasadji was whether if we understand the language better, will it help open new doors for us in how we approach some of the big questions that we have today uh, facing us? And it was clear that we have thousands of years of scholarship in Sanskrit as a language and in applied areas like Ayurveda. And there are there's much more we can do with it if we open up the language and the language correctly. And in those discussions have continued. And as Prasadji said, there was a possibility that we, we're still thinking about it, of having a series of workshops where we can go deep into the language and the importance of language uh, in understanding texts, the old texts of Ayurveda, yoga, and if we go into other Ayush disciplines, you would have Yunani, there are a lot of texts in Arabic and uh, Farsi. Or if you go into Tibetan medicine, you might have other books in uh, other languages. If we don't understand the language correctly, then we run into problems. So that was the whole um, idea then, and it remains with us today. And over the next uh, few slides, I'll take the liberty of sharing a few slides. I just want to take you through and leave some thoughts with you and see if we can move these discussions to the next stage 
and the bigger context within which uh, I'm presenting this is a immediate uh, one, number one, which is that uh, the presidency of the G20 uh, nations and the discussions is being held by India right now. And India has a big role, a growingly important role, not only in the ASEAN region, but across the world in has opportunity to shape discussions for the future. And are we conveying our sentiments to the G20 Secretariat correctly so that they can run with it and come September when the summit will be held in uh, Delhi, some of these ideas can be shared with them. The second big event that uh, go, uh, sh being shaped in India is the establishment of the Global Center for Traditional Medicine, GCTM, the World Health Organization's Global Center for Traditional Medicine that's being established and uh, up and almost, uh, at least uh, administrative structure is up and ready and in operation based at Jamnagar. Are we able to convey uh, the vision that the Ayush systems hold? Are we able to convey this to the member states of the world? Do we have a mature enough language to convey this so that everybody understands, uh, and not just the specialist, but the common man also understands? There are several other such themes on a local level based here in the UK. There is a big prime ministerial level document that's ready, um, a 2030 strategy document between India and the United Kingdom. And within that, um, Ayurveda, research in Ayurveda and promotion of yoga in the National Health Service appears in that document. Are we appreciating the importance of these? And within that, the many layers and levels at which language comes into play. So that is a, the large area through which I want to uh, journey as we go through our uh, presentations today. And I hope we will have time for most important thing that is questions and comments from all of you. So with those few words as a brief introduction, I start with uh, my slides. Uh, Abir, if you will tell me if the slides are visible, then I will proceed. I'm here in the in, in Cambridge. I'm part of the Mind Matter Unification Project that is uh, in the uh, directed by Professor Brian Josephson and located in the Department of Physics here in Cambridge. And you might say, well, what's the connection between physics and uh, all of these things? You will see, and what's the connection between Indian systems philosophy? Shown there is prior Professor Brian Josephson. Um, in 2009, in Milan, in Italy, we met, and Brian was there opening the event. And it was a event looking at the link between Ayurveda and modern health science. And um, it was a bit of a gamble in 2009 that we wanted to do this event, but Professor Dr. Antonio Morandi and his team and several others worked very, very hard to develop a fantastic program. And uh, Brian, in his presentation, was talking about the Eastern philosophy and Western science. And the context was about reality. You know, we want to explain reality. And uh, his statement there was very real, which is reality is too complex to be reduced to a formula in general. There is more physics to be understood and that physics to be understood has been appreciated very well in the Indian systems. So Brian's work and his thinking is important for all of us and himself a person who has uh, yeah. dug very deep into the Vedic systems having spent a lot of time with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and as a meditator he's able to connect with certain areas of um, thinking that most of us might do but with great difficulty and some of us may not be able to reach. So these were the thoughts that Brian shared us with this. 
and driven by that energy, I've since presented in several places. This was one event last year in April at the, the Ayurveda College in Coimbatore. And that title is very important, One Earth, One Health, World Art. And some of it, I'm happy to say, is uh, being resonated again in the G20 uh, vision that Delhi is proposing. Now, my idea there was to see what are the opportunities and challenges for the globalization of Ayurveda and the Ayur systems in general, which is where we are today. I start off from the deep end of physics. Oh, this is a very, very, very recent paper talking about water wires. And this is where physics come to play, uh, comes to play at its best. There are a lot of people who confuse and have very little uh, understanding about water. And this recent paper talks about how water, which is one of the Panjabhutas within um, Ayurveda and within Siddha, we talk about um, water as a very important principle. And this paper talks about the fine analysis of water how water can form long chains. And this is how water goes into cells through the protein molecule aquaporin, the gateway of entry of water into cells. Now, here is a reflection for um, the perspective from the physicist mind talking about water. Now, for us within the world of Ayurveda and the Ayur systems, we have a different understanding about the same material. We understand water. It is one of the five Bhutas. But the language we use to describe water sometimes seems strange for people uh, who are not familiar with it. And they would rather like to understand water using this language, the language of physics. Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, are you uh, displaying any slides? We could only see some thumbnails on the screen. Oh my God, sorry, apologies. Yeah. Thank you for stopping me. Let me try again. The if it's not advancing. Yes. Um, thank you for stopping me. Uh, Let me try again. Tell me if it's working. Yeah, sure. What is on the screen now? Uh, it's, I think it to come. Now we are seeing the thumbnails only. Thumbnails only. Okay, let me start again. On my screen, it is advancing, but it's not advancing. Ah, okay. let me try again. Yeah. This is sometimes a problem with... Uh, uh, that might be a Mac machine, right? That's a Mac, yeah. Uh, Is that... Instead of window, you can go for the full. Okay, let me try again. Thank yeah, you. window also works out. Share the window. Okay. Uh... Prasad, Is it better? Yeah, perfect. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Apologies, sir. Uh, thank you for stopping me. This was uh, this was my first slide, and uh, shown thank there you. is Brian Josephson, uh, who heads the Mind Matter Unification Project. From the very title, you can see it's it sometimes is a confusing one when people say, "What is Mind Matter? How do you unify these two things?" But Brian has a way of doing this, and um, t uh, Prasad, tell me if the screen is moving on. This is. My, yes, perfectly fine. Okay, so I presented uh, in October, in April 2022, at the Sudhir Raj Memorial Webinar Series from the Ayurveda College in Coimbatore about that one, to, one Earth, One Health World Order. This is very much on the minds of uh, policymakers and political uh, minds in in Delhi that we want to arrive at a new way of looking at health, and part of this is inspired by the COVID um, uh, pandemic. That um, we run into problems if we are not prepared. And most times we find our health systems, healthcare systems, disease care systems around the world are skewed in many ways. They seem to visualize health and disease completely differently to what is described in the Ayurvedic texts and the systems, and the Ayush systems. Uh, shown here was that image I showed you about water, a very recent paper that talks about 
molecular wires, water wires is the term that's used. And this is how water enters at its finest level of organization. And that's a long series of molecules, almost like a fine wire. It enters the cells through small proteinaceous uh, uh, pores named aquaporins. Now, I'd said we understand water in so many different ways within uh, uh, Sanskrit. You have so many terms for a simple thing called water. And the meaning they can be, each of those terms can be, is very different. Similarly, for so many other aspects, you have different words expressing those emotions. And shown here is the image that a physicist will understand or somebody interested in molecular dynamics would understand. Now, how do we bring these two languages <clears throat> together and where do we go? As I started off by saying there is a big um, initiative now uh, between the United Kingdom and um, India, uh, a 2030 roadmap for uh, in India UK relations. You can pick this up on the web at the link below. Now, within this document, there are five major subsections, and I'm highlighting something from the fifth section related to health. I urge uh, all of you to look at that uh, look at that document within. Point 32 and subsection 32.1 is this phrase. They are saying explore cooperation on research into Ayurveda and promote yoga in the UK. Now, in the ter in, in terms of um, language, I just want to stop here for a moment and uh, convey to you a short comment made by Professor C. B. Jha, former uh, dean of faculty of Ayurveda at Benares Hindu University. And the comment he made while we were discussing this presentation today and abstract, uh, Professor Jha said, you know, to take a simple word, um, of, to take that word yoga and look at two things that Ayush systems convey, which you will appreciate only if you understand the depth of Sanskrit language. He said there are two words, asanas, asana, everybody understands asana, versus the exercise, abhyas, abhyas. He says these two words mean completely different things. And you have to understand how you convey these two, the importance of these two words when we come to these kind of policy discussions. On the 12th of May last year, we had a wonderful meeting here revolving around this larger um, uh, need at the Royal College of Physicians. Now shown on the right hand side is Gayatri Kumar, who was then the High Commissioner for India here in the United Kingdom. And uh, she made a very interesting comment. She first of all highlighted the need to look at Section 5, which not many people in the audience would have understood if you hadn't consulted the document. And then she pointed to something very special in the podium, and that you can see on, the, on where she is standing, there is a little image of a plant. And this plant appears in the crest of the Royal College of Physicians. Now, sh shown here is the crest of the Royal College of Physicians. You can see the crest designed from 1546. And shown here is uh, an arm reading a pulse. And this is held on top of a plant. And that plant is dadima, pomegranate. Now, there was some understanding from that time about the importance of all these things. So from 1546 to where we are today, those are realities that continue to be with us. We use Dadima very effectively for managing many diseases. And we use uh, pulse diagnosis. A lot of people who routinely do diagnosis, uh, like yes, both in Siddha, Ayurveda, and the Unani systems, who use pulse diagnosis and can feel a lot of things in um, in the human body. Are we appreciating all of these concepts correctly? Are we giving it the importance that it deserves, or are we just dismissing it as something else? Now, out of the 200 words that I offered, uh, President, there's an abstract for this um, talk. I just did a simple word cloud analysis, and you can see what we have here. High on the list, that word cloud is Ayush and uh, health 
And as we go down in the size of those characters, you will see contemporary needs, contemporary approaches. You know, what is it that we need right now? Plus so many other words. Now, if you then take this and rearrange it as I have it in my text, you will get a feel for what is on on my mind and what we are hopefully um what Prasad and I have been discussing for several years now. I'll just read through, I want to dwell on these 200 words and just read through. So first of all, Irish systems. Are we able as a country, are we able to convey to people around the world what we mean by Irish systems? My colleagues in Italy come back to me saying we still don't understand Irish systems. We don't know what it's about. We don't know what you mean by Irish. That's a difficulty. I have colleagues, uh, I want to highlight here, uh, Dr. Bernard Colasso, who's a rheumatologist in uh, Central Middlesex Hospital, recently retired, a very senior rheumatologist. He would say, I don't like that H, the last letter in that Irish system. We hate it. We don't like that homeopathy stuff. Can you get rid of that? You know, Just make it Ayus. And I say, Bernie, this is not how it is played. There is a deeper meaning in all this. In the first slide, when I talk about water, I'm showing you what water is all about. Water is much more. We have understood so little about water, although water is understood in the ancient sciences differently. As we go down this text, we find many other things that are confusing for a global audience. Foundational principles. What do you mean by foundational principles? For us who understand the sciences and who are discussing amongst ourselves, we understand the tattvas and the samitas and the comment, the tikas, the commentaries. who we'll elaborate on this. For a newcomer into this space, it doesn't make sense. They don't know what these foundational principles are. What are these complex planetary health and one health challenges? We have understood within the Ayurvedic systems and in our Upanishads and the Vedas, we have different suktas, the Bhumi Sukta, for instance. It is part of our culture. But if we then try to convey this to other cultures, the best they can give you is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. While we have a different perspective on this problem, how do we convey this correctly? Now, highlighted again are several other themes i will run through them because these are very important for us to take a moment and think about contemporary rendition of ayush knowledge so on one hand people don't understand what are the ayush systems and then you're talking about contemporary rendition of ayush knowledge is far from optimum they don't get it we have many of our texts which are written in sanskrit or tamil or uh, farsi or uh, and are we translating these correctly? Or is the knowledge that we want to convey still trapped in that language? And what do we mean by subtle, culturally entwined? Now, when we look at um, the Indian systems, we will find we have many paramparas. Prasadji is here. His father is a, a, a very important uh, person who has managed to reinforce the Kerala parampara and uh, of understanding five systems and this is not known to people that if you go into maharashtra you will have a maharashtra parampara of understanding the science if you go to gujarat or rajasthan or west bengal they all have their teachers who've developed large schools and those are the paramparas and those paramparas are very special because they connected the knowledge to the local needs not all plants were available everywhere. Seasons were different. You know, it rained more in certain places, so they adapted it. Are we able to convey this to people without distorting, diluting the rationale, or more importantly, disenfranchising or disappointing the qualified, inspired practitioners? And when it comes to the educational systems, these are big challenges. We have thousands of years of history, and it is very easy to lose our way in that 5,000 years of history. When we've already lost our way over 500 years of history of the Royal College of Physicians, it was set up with certain things in mind, but where it is today is a completely different matter. And how do we break those barriers and do we have to revisit and come out with something else, which I call a soundless language? 
And I'll give you one or two examples in the context of Ayurveda as we proceed on. And the second thing is a transdisciplinary approach. You know, we shouldn't limit ourselves to any one area, but we must use the best of whatever is available around the world. And for instance, today we have, um, we're privileged to have this opportunity of using the internet to connect with people and to get people to come and join us and discuss about things and learn about things and share their thoughts. We want to use that correctly. We want to use those kind of tools. These are the contemporary tools. And that will bring many, many people from other disciplines also to join us and think about the transdisciplinary approach. And finally, I use a strange word called life coherent, subtle languages. Now, what do you mean by life coherent, subtle languages? If we go into the Vedas, they talk about how there are certain rules that are non-negotiables. There are rules that are there and there are rules which are almost axiomatic. You, can't, you, you cannot break them. If you break them, you break them at your peril. They will give you more problems. And these are things that are very important when we come into the future of sustainable living, education, rural development. These are all very important things for particularly for India and the poorer part of the world. And to enable employment for people based on these rules and respecting uh, the links between humanity, habitat and the health. So I wanted to dwell on this a little bit. Now, we have minds here, we're fortunate to be in this city, to have minds who have looked at certain of these areas in the past and shown here on the left, Sidney Brenner, who's no more. He was a very special mind for us. And he was the one who showed how you could crack a code. And that code was the link between a simple DNA sequence, which is a language based on just what we say, four chemicals uh, abbreviated as A, C, G, and T, the four bases to the next level of complexity, which is proteins, which are coded by 20 amino acids. How do you make this? What is the code that links these two? And Sydney was the person who broke this and um, who gave us the genetic code. And he went on to do so many other things in biology. He discovered cell death, which is a very programmed cell death, which is a very interesting concept in life, that when we develop, when we build complex organisms, there are certain specified, very specific points in the development of that organism when you have to kill certain cells for the program to continue, for their organism to grow. And we call it program cell death. He discovered many of those things together with some of his uh, team members, uh, important among them, Professor John Sulston, who went on to write the Royal Society's uh, uh, Planet and Health, a big report that's again available at the Royal Society webpage. Now, Sydney later on in his life would say that I have done all this, I've spent 60 plus years looking at what uh, I've shown you how DNA is, uh, the, the DNA code is converted into protein, what the genetic code is, et cetera, et cetera. I've shown you what that language is. And that language has then been understood over the last um, X number of years. He said, the future, the next 25 years, we're gonna to have to teach biologists another language. And he said, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's going to be, but it's very clear that, you know, the, we need to move the science ahead. If Sydney, I don't think he knew, I interacted quite a bit with Sydney, but I don't think he knew what Ayurveda was. If he were with us today, he would say Ayurveda is that one exemplar another language. There are many aspects within biology in the Ayurvedic text that will be invaluable for biologists. And I have taken Sydney's comment, teaching biologists another language, and I've added that other bit there, which is teaching biologists and doctors another language. Before I move on to the next slide, I just want to stop here for a moment to say that it is only 70 years this year. Uh, the, um, this year is the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the structure. In 70 years, that language of DNA has touched every area of biology. It has gone into medical practice. It has gone into every area of biology. And we have understood so much about DNA. And we understand new languages that are based on the DNA language, the language of epigenetics, a whole set of rules, the rules of which 
and the practice of which and how it is used in uh, handling and managing health is seen in Ayurveda. I, that's my opinion. Complex systems, our human body is such a complex system. It is unlikely we will ever understand how the fine rules operate. But is there something else? Is there another way to appreciate this? These are phrased by Dennis Nobel in his 10 Rules of Complex Systems. So Dennis gives us a list of 10 rules on the bottom, on the left-hand side, and I've highlighted the one on the bottom. There are many more to be discovered. A genuine theory of biology does not exist yet. Dennis gives us a reminder, constant reminder, that we have to keep our mind open to understanding. So if I take Dennis's comments and Sydney's comments, and I then say, well, what is Ayurveda all about? Ayurveda seems to provide us that language. It is a way in which we've reduced the complexity of the human body, the complexity of the environment that we live in, and brought together a convergence of these two using the concepts of Panchabhut Siddhant and Tridosh Siddhant. And sh we show the world how you can use these principles to stay in good health and heal disease, etc. Now, there's nothing new about all this because all this has been offered to us again and again and again. So this is shown here is Nagarjuna, the second Buddha uh, himself, a great scholar. Nagarjuna is also the many Nagarjunas that are uh, mentioned in the past, but Nagarjuna, this Nagarjuna gave us the 15 indicators of health and uh, the Panchadasha Prakara, as they say. And within this is uh, the list, I put them in three columns here, far right for those who can read this uh, Devanagari, you will see Tadalakshana, Panchadasha Prakara. And I want to dwell briefly on that first word. Aghara comes here. So, aghar, food, food. And he then goes on to elaborate about food. And for us, we know that food is central. Food is medicine, so does Siddha, so does Yunani, and so, does the, so do the other systems of medicine. But are we understanding food correctly? We leave it at that. But the connection I want to make here is between food and health and food and the environment. So, uh, effectively, there is a, 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 a way in which we are connecting environment to our health through the lens of food. But if we look in the central column here, written in, in blue, the uh, text, it says desire for food at the right time and proper digestion and elimination of waste and proper functioning of our sense organs and a tranquil mind. And it goes on to talk about the lakshanas of these things, the indicators of um, all of what makes you a healthy human being, proper sound sleep, early natural waking without any discomfort, and so on. On the middle part, middle section here, is nothing but physiology. So from it, the way I would interpret this is by saying from the time of Nagarjuna to where we are today, all we have done is improve the resolution of understanding of that physiology. Yes, on the right-hand side, it is offered to us in a very strange language. But the language only conveys the truth. There is nothing more we can add to it except details. It doesn't change those rules. As long as we take the human form, these are the rules that we will live with. Now, I go to a very young Wagner at the Department of Psychology in Finland, University of Tartu. And uh, Professor Wagner is a social, what's a social psychologist. And he, um, and he talks in this paper titled Vernacular Science Knowledge, its role in everyday life communication. And I just want to contrast what Nagarjuna told us, what was offered to us in the previous side, this, the Panchadasha Prakara, with how the challenge we have of conveying deep knowledge that may not be understood fully, the complexity of the human body, yet we need to convey it to people. Nagarjuna gave it, gave it to us using the 
Panchadasha Prakara, and in this all of Panchadasha Prakara is nothing but contemporary versus uh, what Wolfgang G is saying. He says, the public's understanding of science is embedded in the web of individual, collective, and political process of communication. Yes, we know that. Public discourse makes science more than and at the same time less than a stripped down version of the original. Now, this is very important. We look at the Samhita, take Charaka Samhita, take any one of the sections, you will find this problem. The more you read the text, for those who understand, the more they are excited by this. But what about the people who don't read the text? And that includes the students of Ayurveda. What do you do here? What do you offer them? And these are questions that are troubling the minds of a lot of people in India right now. You know, we've developed a new curriculum, the NCIS, um, National Council. Uh, and there are questions being asked about the curriculum. Is our pedagogy correct? Or is the curriculum at fault? Do, can we deliver that curriculum correctly? These are complicated questions. Anyway, he says, um, vernacular and communicative knowledge, which is important for us if we want to take certain dialogues in certain directions, resembles science knowledge, which is what would be in the Samhitas or in the uh, Tattvas and uh, Darshanas. They resemble science knowledge as much as a hamburger resembles the original filet. Now, it says that hamburger is tastier than the original unseasoned meat. And so everyday science is popular and good to talk about, even though it reflects little, if anything, of its original scientific shape. Now, is this conflict, there is a conflict here, is this conflict going to stay with us or are we able to resolve this? And to do this, I'm going to use that food uh, point that I touched on briefly and start with one example formulation and this Ayurvedic formulation is a very important one for certain GI tract problems so we'll start with food we have taken food as a central point we are connecting it to what uh, Wolfgang Wagner is talking about the challenge of conveying the depth of certain knowledge systems to the common man and across cultures this compound is very old formulation. It says it normalizes digestive pitta and vata. So we have lost the game already for those in the world who don't understand pitta and vata correctly and are not able to visualize pitta and vata. And then it goes on to say it corrects indigestion, absorption, assimilation of ingested food. Okay, this is very much like the Panchadasha Prakara. Whatever is wrong they might, uh, within the human body in terms of those functions related to food, we might be able to correct it. Now, this has herbs within it. And it is a quick relief in a complication that is almost global. Whoever eats food runs into these problems. A paper published by our colleagues at, uh, from Dehradun in Uttarakhand gives you the ingredients of this churma. Um, ten ingredients, ginger, pepper, long pepper, ajmod, and jira, two types of jira, hingu, and so on, and salt. Now, for people who use this, they see immediate relief. But is that enough to convey the depth of our knowledge to people? This is the language perhaps some people might want to use to explain this problem. This might be the language where we might want to review our text, the Samhitas, and see how we can make our Samhitas resonate a little more with people in other lands without drawing them too much into the language of uh, uh, Sanskritam and the coded language of and what can we do something else is there another way to present this this might be one way and it's perhaps that silent language i'm talking about you know it's there will be better acceptance of this knowledge shown on the left hand side the kind of complications in the gi tract when you eat the wrong food or complications in the gi tract based on the change of the seasons uh, 
and at the right hand side the fine chemistry that releases that leads you and points you to the fine uh, uh, gases now this is a big area where there is a lot of emphasis in Ayurveda we talk about the Mahashrota and this is one area where there is a lot of interest around the world the role of the gut microbiota in nutrition and health we know that um, there are many complications that arise from GI tract disturbance and for an aging population in many parts of the world um, this is understood but they haven't grappled with it correctly they haven't understood this is a paper from the British Medical Journal uh, at the reference below description of the areas of the particularly the colon, the large intestine, where there are all kinds of complications that come from. And I highlight this one point here, increased cardiovascular risk that is also ascribed to the gut microbiome. So on one hand, we have this image of a churna, and we keep talking about it as being very helpful, but we are not able to bridge it and connect it with a program like what is being developed here between, at the University of Nottingham, and Canada and Israel and London. Where is, who is at fault uh, and how do we get around this little problem? Now within this, as we go back in time, uh, uh, my good friend uh, Bernie Colasso shared this a few days ago, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, and the work of two amazing scientists who take us into the world of uh, who introduced us to the world of the immune system. And in particular, there is one person. I highlighted that section showing how over a matter of a hundred plus years we go from a land of great learning, Kharkiv, Ukraine, what is now, which is very much on the news, and excellent knowledge that came out from there uh, being communicated in so many different ways to where we are today. And when we come to, I'll leave that there and move to another interesting story that's up there recently. This comes from Brazil and about the prisons of Brazil. And it appeared in uh, Reuters some time back. Pr Brazil's prisons, life beyond crime. And a fascinating story of how Brazil's prison program teaches yoga and massage to prisoners. And the kind of The right hand side uh, therapist perhaps teaching or informing a prisoner about mm -hmm. ayurvedic massage now this knowledge will be accepted in many parts of the world and it will educate people and it can bring about big change in society but where where does language help and where does language get in the way here is a ongoing uh, happenings here uh, uh, later this month on the 10th of February in Hyderabad there'll be a big meeting the ISP healthcare so-called uh, program number four and shown uh, is Dr. Sharma recently uh, uh, talking about I'm looking after two big programs the Ayushman Bharat uh, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arog Yojan and the Ayushman Bharat digital mission are we making our point forcefully enough in this platform to get people to understand the benefits of Ayurveda, how Ayurveda Ayush systems can make healthcare affordable, accessible, and available for all everywhere? Are these messages about Ayushman India, the world's largest program, uh, public health program and health provision program that's going around the world? Are we conveying to them the fundamental concepts as shown in this wonderful poster prepared by Girish Thilu and uh, Professor Gigi Gangadharan, Bhushan Patwadanji and Ashok Vaidyaji. Are we able to convey, are we conveying it correctly, the complexity and the beauty and the elegance of this science? And are we preparing it correctly for the 22nd century and beyond? Now, in several talks recently, I wanted to shift that agenda away from Ayurveda biology to be a, to, to a slightly more inclusive 
program about Ayush biology. We need to understand the entirety of Ayush systems in its fullest. And what is that language, one language we will be able to use uh, to arrive at what I call deep health, health for all, anytime, anywhere. And this perhaps is a way in which we can start to develop programs that brings together people from different corners of the world and convey perhaps that using a language that everybody understands or perhaps a new language that is based on a distillation of what everybody understands. This is an event that was held in 2019, uh, Indo-European workshop on the next generation, hosted at the Department of Physiology of the Olympia Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And the theme of this event was physiology for good health and prevention of non-communicable diseases. Now, I feel we are not conveying depth of what is in the Ayurveda text and the Samhitas correctly to people who will be able to run with it more. Here from France, from the Medical University in Graz and the European Ayurveda Foundation, we are working together to see if we can take the insights from India's traditional sciences and convey it to people in either in India or elsewhere on the importance of this. Um, I mentioned early on that an effort is going on in India. India has taken charge of this WHO center. It's a wonderful opportunity. How quickly can we convey the important messages and how do we convey it using a language that will be acceptable for all? When I talk about this language, the image in my mind is the image of DNA and how in 70 years a simple model, a double helix model, and the logic of that, it doesn't have a language, it is a silent image. How that has touched the, every science in the world, uh, in, in biological sciences across the world. Can we, can we take a message into uh, the system that's evolving very fast? And can we use that to get rid of that mistrust that is there in the system for practice-based evidence and the use of that terrible term the practice-based evidence which is at the very heart of some of these things because the depth of the complexity of biological of a human body is too difficult to understand using a reductionist approach and if we don't have another way to visualize the human body then we will never have a holistic description of how the body works in health and disease Unfortunately, when we take a mature language like what we have in Ayurveda or Siddha or Yunani and try to express it to people, they would call it fraudulent science. And this is not acceptable. How do, what is it that's missing and what is it that we need to do? Ayurveda is now on uh, the list of the traditional systems and you can see the number of countries around the world who are starting to wake up to this possibility. might be the safest and the easiest way to approach this and take this message to the rest of the world. Then shown on the right hand side here are the six regions of the World Health Organization. Each of these regions have contributed to the portfolio of uh, the Global Center for Traditional Medicine, Africa contributing African traditional medicine and so on. America contributing chiropractic and osteopathy, the Eastern Mediterranean region providing traditional Arab and Islamic medicine, uh, which is again filled with so many treasures, Europe offering naturopathy and homeopathy, Southeast Asia offering Ayurveda, Yoga, Yunani and Thai medicine, and the Western Pacific region offering traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, tuna. It is not all of what these regions hold, but it's a good start. And what is it that we need to find as a language to, to take these messages on? This, uh, the recently completed um, uh, World Ayurveda Kong had 16 teams, and I'm hoping that the abstracts of all the posters that were submitted and presented will all be made available to the whole world via the website and touching so many areas touching connecting health and the environment and um, all the way down to Pashu Ayurveda, the way in which you can treat 
and help the health of animals using Ayurveda, plus so many other areas in those 16 themes. I won't read the whole lot of them, but they're all there, extremely important for the world. Now, in terms of this shift, physiology to pathophysiology we have known for a long time that pathology and pathophysiology is only physiology with obstacles there are certain obstacles that appear we don't know for some instances we know what those obstacles are but we don't know what the others are the system is too complex to understand but there is a language there there is a language of Ayurveda that actually provides this but if that language of Ayurveda is then interfaced with some other final language then we are able to convey the importance of this to other people around the world. This is the famous quote from uh, Verhoff saying, no matter how we twist and turn, we shall always come back to the cell. So there's no avoiding that. And pathology is nothing but physiology with obstacles. So that cell concept appears in Charakasam. is used the paramanu deha paramanu and it is understood there is enough in there if we understand the language if we understand what they were trying to convey to us thousands of years ago keep in mind this was a text which presumably is about two and a half or two thousand years old they had these concepts but the language is very um, difficult for most people to understand what is the meaning of Ati Sukshma, Ati Indriya? These are concepts that require a deep commitment to understanding that language. And if we don't have that language, we are trapped in the beauty of wisdom. We are not able to convey this to other people. Now, the next few slides, I just want to touch a little bit on that one area of cancer and where a new language is evolving and how we've understood over the last few decades many aspects of cancer and where those new samhitas might be evolving. Shown here are genomic websites, 15 cancer genomic websites. There's a lot of work, a lot of input is going, a lot of finance is going into shaping these cancer, the cancer websites. But there is no way, we haven't found a way to connect this with the language of Deha Paramanu. Cancer begins with a complication in a cell in the body. And that is being understood in great detail here on the right-hand side. But we are not in a position to connect it with the concept of uh, the Deha Paramanu. We are not able to connect it with the concept of Shrotas. We are not able to connect it with the concept of Agni and Ama and all that richness that sits on one side versus the concepts on the other side. If I move a little bit closer into the cell and look at things in great detail and show other languages that are at play within the cell, within the cell you find what I, what in my mind comes to me as silent languages. There are many processes at play and I talked about the DNA side, 70th anniversary, and here is an image of what has come out of all the technology and techniques and distillation of computer science and how we display information. And we get, I want to highlight this one simple gene. It is a gene that controls the sodium, calcium, lithium exchange in the mitochondria. So we've gone beyond Deha Paramanu. We have gone into the way in which another intelligence works within the single cell, the Deha Brahmana, and that is the mitochondria. And we are looking now at one gene and trying to understand how this gene works. Now, this gene um, manages the movement of sodium, calcium, lithium between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. And there was a recent, there's a recent paper talking about curcumin and uh, inhibitor they share anti-tumoral mechanisms in colorectal cancer. Now I stop here for a moment because the study deals with the best of DNA, 
and it's connecting with curcumin, which is understood, at least not as curcumin, but as um, Haridra in Ayurveda. And many who are within the, uh, the, the Ayurveda biologists or the Ayurveda, the Vaidyas listening to this, would have heard about what is used in treatments, what are its rasapanchak, what are its properties, and how it is used in different traditions, and how, it's, how the effect is understood. If you can take that local knowledge and then now integrate it with this silent language of DNA, we start to see reasons why this might work. And the reasons why there might be some truth in all those suggestions about Haridra, about turmeric, uh, as a health promoting entity. How do we make this dialogue happen between the people who are working with genes and cells and who are observing things? And they are talking about a potential anti-tumoral activity of curcumin. How do we connect them with the rich concepts that are there on the other side in our understanding of cell biology and systems biology as understood in Ayurveda? I won't dwell on, on these fine details, but I want to just spend one minute here talking about what we know of that one protein. So on one hand, it's involved in transport of calcium sodium into the mitochondria and bringing it out. There are many aspects of the mitochondria that contribute to the energy of the cell. And we know energetically a cell has to misbehave for it to start developing towards the cancer pathway. And when we look at it closely, we find that this enzyme is strongly inhibited by zinc. A suggestion here might be to start looking at zinc, of which the Ayurvedic systems provide some of the most elaborate body of knowledge on how zinc is used as a routine uh, metallic preparation or a herbometallic preparation to manage so many conditions. So when we bring these knowledge systems together, we suddenly get insights into where we might have truth that is within us and how we might be able to use that knowledge as a new framework to start to examine complex and difficult conditions like fine detail that we could be able to understand on how uh, pancreatic ductal carcinoma evolves and what is the behavior of the cell and how it changes. And the same thing shown here and uh, how small changes take place as the cell shifts away from its normal physiology towards um, uh, 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 compromised physiology and onwards to ill health. So for a biologist, I started off by saying there is there are small molecules that permit water to come into cells, and shown here is just that aquaporin. And when we look at how the cells behave and how their behavior changes, you start to see certain changes in the movement of water and the proteins that control the movement of water. But that language is a language that seems too far away from the language of Ayurveda and the texts and the Samhitas. But if you dwell on it for a moment, you will see the connection between what is there, what is described in the Ayurveda text about the Paramanu and about the Atindriya aspect and the Atisukshma aspects and how there are aspects of Vayu that are disturbed and several other there in the Samhitas, but needs to be reinterpreted. Now, where find those skills and how are we going to impart those skills to our future ideas and how are we going to convey this to the rest of the world? I think that is the open question and that is why we are here to discuss and debate about these things. Now, 
the last part, I want to touch on a few aspects related to the concept of meridians. Now, this is very well understood in the Indian systems, in particularly in the world of um, yoga. Now, when talking to Professor C.B. Jha, he mentioned a very interesting thing, that we have a whole body of knowledge where we have divided it into two parts, the material aspects and the immaterial aspects of how the body works. The material aspects comes within the domain of Ayurveda, Siddha, and perhaps Yunani. And uh, the immaterial part, the energetic part, which is, which is a very difficult one to understand, sits in the world of yoga. When we talk about prana, and we talk about pranayama, and we talk about the nadis, and we talk about the um, the major uh, nadis in our body and the 72,000 nadis that run through the body and holds prana and helps the flow of prana. Now, these are all very, very difficult ideas. And it, it, even today, it's a very difficult one to get our mind around. We don't know how, how to explain these things. But the Chinese system, I will show you the book, the medical classic of the Allo Emperor, Emperor. Now, these are texts that talk about these things from thousands of years. So clearly, there is a feeling, and there is a feeling for this. It's something that people intuitively sense. But how do we convert this into science that contemporary technology and techniques can approach and perhaps model using mathematics? Shown here is the work of uh, Herbert Frohle, uh, a German born British physicist, and his work on many areas, what he called frolic condensates. And he wanted to talk about coherent systems. And he says, no matter how complex the system, you can visualize it as a, as a large uh, condensate, you know, um, a complex condensate working in harmony. And perhaps this is how the ancient rishis visualized the human body. They visualized the human body complex uh, working of the Panjabhutas, which is held together. They visualized the Tridosh, and they visualized how there are subsystems, which are called the Dhatus, the Saptadhatus. And then they visualized how these things are held together and how they work together. And they gave a model. Now, all models are just models. Uh, there's an old statement which goes that says that all models are wrong, but some are useful. We should, if we take that approach, we can say, well, Ayurvedic, Tridoshinta, Pajabhut Siddhartha, etc., is a model. Could be wrong, but it's very helpful. It helps us explain a complex system. And it helps us explain the complex system using in, in very difficult circumstances. And Frolic here gives us a way in which we can visualize this mathematically. And he says a flux tube on the left hand side is a flux tube. Now for all of us, uh, all of the Ayurveda people, they say the body can be visualized as a big tube with things sticking on the outside. The universe running through this Mahashrota. And this is what is almost like a flux tube. Uh, Frolic then goes on to give us the mathematics of these flux tubes. He has written about it. Books have been published. And these are two of his books that are available for those who would like to study. Biological Coherence and Response to External Stimuli. Now, for on first reading, the title Biological Coherence and Response to External Stimuli might seem too strange. But that is what Ayurveda is all about. When we talk about Dhinacharya and Ritucharya and Svastavrit, it is that external stimuli and how it interacts with the human body. And Frolic gives us all of this information. So there is something there that is very important. And that can be that we can, we don't have to rediscover. We can connect with Frolic's work and try and get some inspiration of where and how we can be consistent with Ayurveda and Irish knowledge, but at the same time, make it ready for a global dialogue using a neutral language and perhaps some mathematics or mathematical language and to convey it onward. I stop, I go on with a few examples here. Shown here is a very important plant that is understood in Ayurveda for thousands of years, the Tinospora codifolia. 
shown on the right hand side, Professor Rajesh Dabur, uh, the Department of Biochemistry at the Maharishi Dhan the University in Rotak in Haryana. Now his study is very interesting. It talks about the chemo profiling of Tinospora cordifolia, and the reason is very simple. Tinospora cordifolia is a very, is almost a divya, divya aushadi, as they call it, um, guruchi, and um, or also called kiloi in several places. And it is said somewhere in the text that for certain conditions, if giloi is harvested as uh, the, the stem of the plant is harvested from a plant that is growing on neem trees, then this is very beneficial. In the north of India, it is called neem giloi. I don't know what it is, how, how it's described in the south of India, but neem, as you know, is also a very important medicinal plant. But giloi, Tinospora cordifolia, grown on a neem tree, has additional benefits. Now, this is, we just accept it, and that's how it is, and nobody questions. Now, Rajesh Ji went on to ask, what happens if you grow this in different plants? Ficus bengalensis. They're all important plants, you know, tamarind plant, etc. And what effect will we find? Will we find any difference? I have the best techniques of HPLC, uh, mass spectroscopy, and will I see something very special? So he grew his Tinosporia on uh, the Guruji plant on several uh, trees, you know, six different trees, and he harvested. And he started measuring the presence of these chemicals in here. So highlighted, I've just highlighted four chemicals. These are all very important, uh, therapeutically important chemicals. And he finds that four of these, I've, as I said, I'll talk only about four of these. There are four of these that are differentially expressed when giloy is grown in neem. If you take those four chemicals and you just do a casual search in PubMed, these are the kind of references you'll find. Very, very important chemicals, the area that's being worked on. So on one hand, we have knowledge that is cited and known to us for hundreds of years, but it's very cryptic. And now using the best of technologies, we can open this up and we can observe the things. I, present, I wanted to present this for a simple reason, because in Hyderabad, we have the, the big chemical um, CSIR Institute in Hyderabad. And if we take this whole observation, this is a very old study now, I don't know, six or seven years old. If you take the study to our colleagues at the CSIR Institute and say, by the way, we want to explore this further, we will we get a respectable reception? I leave that as an open question. In terms of the global dialogues that are going on, I highlight here our interactions at the University of Toronto and what is called the University Health Networks, which is a network of all the university hospitals and the hospitals there in Toronto, Toronto General, Toronto Western, the Princess Margaret Hospital, Toronto Rehab, and the Michener Institute uh, called KITE. And, uh, at the University Health Networks, and shown on the left-hand side is the leader of the program. India now has a, a discussion going on with Toronto, a very mature discussion, and we are hoping that we can take these kind of um, uh, possibilities into areas about diabetes or cancer or uh, mental health. Uh, the uh, Minister of Mental Health, um, the uh, Deputy Minister of Mental Health, Michael Tubolo, was recently in India for the Pravasi Bharat Divas program at um, Indore in Madhya Pradesh. And he's gone back having met with people in Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand and with dialogues with the Nimhans to develop a whole new program on mental health and Ayush, which is a major problem and in, 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 uh, in Canada and around the world, of course. And shown here the kind of areas where we will be able to develop future programs if we can enable a good dialogue. I'm going to quickly rush through. I'm aware uh, that we are running out of time. I'll quickly run through a few slides uh, just before I finish off this talk and I'd highlight this one point here about a simple procedure that is understood in Ayurveda and Siddha 
um, and yoga too, for hundreds of years, if not thousands, the procedure of nasya. And I connect this with this ongoing, the pandemic that we had, the COVID pandemic, and how using the best of contemporary biology, we di di discover a new language, a new language that is at play in our nasal mucosa. And the interaction between the bacteria that reside in our nasal cavity and the local immune system within the mucosa. So on one hand, this is the description that we have, inspired, of course, by the ongoing the, the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, work that comes from the University of Perugia in Italy, you will recollect um, Perugia, uh, Italy had the very high incidence when at the early stages of pandemic, it was almost the global center uh, for the highest number of cases. So that inspired the researchers at the University of Perugia to look at what is there in the nasal micro, uh, nasal cavity and the microbiome, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I want to remind you that the Vaidyas here know that this is a procedure that is in routine practice in Ayurveda for thousands of years. Jalneti and other types of neti is described in yoga. But we have not been able to present it in a way that convinces people. Now, the people in Italy have come up with something, but they are not able to connect it with the safety and the efficacy of this procedure. So this is the bridge that we need to make. Shown here in detail, the microbiology, local biochemistry of the nasal cavity and the interaction between the bacteria and the local immune system. If you look at this, if you look at this uh, uh, slightly busy slide, I'll trim it down to its basis, the basics, which is tryptophan, one of the 20 amino acids. You'll recollect this is what Sidney Brenner helped us understand, the connection between DNA and the genetic code and the amino acids, 20 amino acids of the proteins. Now we are looking at just one of those amino acids, tryptophan. Tryptophan is the building block for a collection of important chemicals, serotonin and melatonin, very important for working with the human body. And the bacteria play a very important role in the nasal cavity. This is new knowledge uh, to shape that biochemistry and the balance at that in the local environment within the nasal cavity and the mucosa. If there is dysbiosis in your nasal cavity, then you can get predominance of certain bacteria that will push the pathway downward, shown here, coming down from tryptophan down towards what we call the kynurin pathway. And the fascinating bit about the team in Perugia was that when, we, when they sampled the microbiome of people coming for acute care, you found this huge dysbiosis. The bacteria there were pushing, it, pushing tryptophan down the wrong direction to give rise to pro-inflammatory chemicals. These are things that we know today, uh, pro-inflammatory versus those health-promoting chemicals going horizontally towards serotonin and melatonin. And now we can understand that uh, how that fine balance is disturbed. Surprisingly, when we overlay the air pollution map of Italy onto where we had high incidence of COVID at that, those early days, we see a perfect match. We see a perfect match between extent of air pollution and COVID severity. What we also know today is these particular matter, particulate matters that we breathe in, they are triggers for this dysbiosis, not in everybody, but in some people, it upsets the balance. Now, note, the chemicals that we are talking about going from tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin. A silent language is at play. There's communication that's going on. If we look at this part, this is where Nasya operates. Nasya helps maintain something. We don't know what it is. Perhaps it maintains a certain balance. It helps maintain that microbial balance. Now, if you look within here, 
anatomists have known for a long time, this is the seat of the pituitary, where my arrowhead is. There's a lot of communication between the nasal mucosa and the pituitary. If you disturb the balance here, you're going to disturb the balance in the pituitary. Any inflammation in the pituitary will affect the hypothalamus, the adrenal axis, and that is enough to give you severe pathology, which can be very easily avoided if you follow the simple procedure. Now, all of this is important, and we have this knowledge with us, but somehow language has prevented us from communication. Language has prevented us from making these messages clear to people who might be able to take these on and run faster with it. Um, finish off with a few slides here about um, a simple image. Uh, we talked earlier about the gut microbes, and uh, we talked about that important formulation, the Churna, and we talked about problems in the gut slowly towards other complications, for instance, colon cancer. A long period of progression, 10 to 20 years, and a series of genes are activated and inactivated and deleted, and, and all, those, all that is happening over a 20-year period, but we don't know where it's happening. We might be able to help enable new dialogues in that space, to enable new dialogues in understanding this progression in the disease and understanding using the Ayurvedic concept of Kriyakala, Shad Kriyakala, as a people in the Ayurveda community know all this well, we might be able to understand a little more about this blue boxed area where there is a shift from normal to abnormal and an area where there is reversible physiology and there is a link between nutrition and stresses in this area. These are all things that are known to biology, to Ayurvedas. I'm going to stop here for a moment um, just to see if uh, Prasad will give me a little more time uh, or... If... Sure, sure, sir. Please uh, go ahead. Do I have a little more time? Yes, yes. Thank you, Prasad. I'll... The, not too many more slides, but stop me, Prasad, stop me again if um, the yes. side, slides are not displaying correctly. Yes, yes, sure. There are questions, definitely you can take it later. I won't be long, I'll just take, take um, just run through one few more things, particularly about... Um, um, sure, please go ahead. So there are areas here where we will be able to come up with new thinking that is available too. Last year, this was a story that was presented at the Ayush Summit by Prime Minister Modi. And he talked about this, um, the daughter of um, um, the former Kenyan Prime Minister, um, uh, Prime Minister Odinga, and here shown is a story that comes with especially uh, important for um, a lot of people who believe that Ayurveda has strength and a lot of people who don't believe that Ayurveda has, can do miracles. Shown here, Rosemary on the left-hand side and Rosemary today with uh, uh, the Ayurvedic physician Narayan Nambudri of Sridharyam, um, a family that has uh, perfected uh, the whole area of Netra Chikitsa Ayurveda for eye diseases. And Rosemary suffered with some inflammation. Uh, atrophy uh, triggered by inflammation. And uh, she was without sight for several years when somebody said, why don't you go to India? And uh, there are specialists there and they will treat. And show on the right is uh, Rosemary uh, with her eyesight back. Will the world believe this? Yes, it's something that happens. It's something that's happened. And uh, for Narayan Nambudri in, uh, in Sridharyam, this is not a surprise because he understood the human body in a certain way and he could handle and treat this condition. But are we able to convey this message to other people? The last uh, uh, bit I want to share here, uh, Prasaji, is about this concept, Ritucharya. And I've been 
working with these images and slides, I present this in several presentations just to highlight one point to show where the connection is between Ayurveda and uh, contemporary sciences and uh, the immune system um, and why we have very strong messages in Ayurveda about the concept of Ritu, the concept of divided the year into six Ritus and how there are treatment procedures that are specialized and refined in different uh, geographic areas of India. In the south of India, in Kerala, we follow a procedure called Karkadaga Chikitsa. I think people from Kerala here uh, and from the south will know this well. And in the north, there are different other protocols, but all based on this concept of Ritu, the seasons. The Indian, the Vedic calendar divides and the Ayurvedic calendar divides the 12 months of the year into six Ritu, six seasons. And the six seasons are follow the lunar calendar. So based on the full moons and the transition from full moon to the next full moon and so on, you can you have a calendar. And based on that, uh, specific procedures are recommended. This study is very fascinating because it was done here in Cambridge by Professor John Todd, who's a professor of immunology, uh, who's moved recently to Oxford. He's based in Oxford uh, as part of the Welcome uh, Center for Immunology there. And uh, John's study with the PhD student, uh, um, the first author on the paper, talks about seasonal gene expressions. Uh, the paper is available, published in 2015. And this is one a simple example that connects Ayurvedic physiology with contemporary physiology through a bridge language, the language of gene expression. Silent language, but language which you, which you can track and understand using certain technologies that will open up how genes are expressed. I, will, I won't spend too much time here, but I just want to highlight the analysis, the intensity of the analysis. They looked at 4,000 out of the approximately 24,000 genes, and they've looked at the expression of these 4,000 protein coding genes in the nucleated cells, the white blood cells, and also the adipose tissue, the fat accumulating tissue which I suppose in Ayurveda would be called uh, uh, Medadhatu. And they're looking at the expression. So John doesn't know about Ayurveda. He doesn't know about seasons. He doesn't know about Ritucharya. He doesn't know about any Ritusandhi aspects, et cetera, et cetera. But he does a completely uh, independent analysis and he looks at independent of the knowledge of Ayurveda, and he looks at the expression of these genes, and he finds that the immune system has a profound pro-inflammatory transcriptomic profile during the, he calls it the European winter, but it's mostly the northern um, uh, hemisphere. And rushing through this very quickly, he says that there's a increased level of soluble IL-6 receptor, one of the interleukins pro-inflammatory, C-reactive proteins, a marker for uh, inflammation, and uh, risk biomarkers for cardiovascular, psychiatric, and autoimmune diseases that have a peak incidence in winters. And here shown on the top right-hand side on the top uh, graph are the six, the 12 months. We can remap this to Ritus and you can put the approximate ritus as seen uh, onto this, and you will see a set of genes that have increased expression with, as the ritu changes, a set of genes that have a decreased expression as the ritu changes, and the connection being made with the immune system. Now, this is just confirmation of a knowledge that is available to us for thousands of years, but dress are we seeing the correct way to present Ayurvedic knowledge for the 21st century and beyond? Perhaps this might be the way without compromising the authenticity or distorting Ayurvedic knowledge.
And we will see that these expressions are also, this, this is called antiphasic profiles, are not only in Raktadatu, in the immune cells, but also within the Medadatu. It is also working independently there. So here is one example. Uh, again, for those interested, do consult this paper because the details are amazing, but don't be intimidated by the language that is there. Keep in mind, if you're coming to it from Ayurveda, keep in mind that it is only Ayurvedic knowledge at play here of Ritucharya and the Ritusandhis. And there is a, for the contemporary biologists, it is a way to I was looking at this area here when there is an infliction point. I hope you can see my cursor here. Between January and February, there's an infliction point here. Now, this is the area where we have Makar Sankranti for the north of India. This area where we have an infliction point. And this is the time when the sun is entering the Makar Rashi. And so much is described in our texts about that transition. And so much is described about what we are meant to do at that time of the year. And it said, if you do this, your bala will increase. Now, what is bala? Is that concept of bala, is it to remain only for those who understand bala and Sanskrit? Is the concept of vyadik shamatva? the ability to withstand disease, is that to remain only in the world of Ayurveda and those who understand what Vyadi is and Shamaktva means? No. There is a way in which we need to make this slightly more democratic and get this knowledge out to many more people using different ways. I finish off here with the concept of Nadis, subtle energies, subtle shrotas, shown in the middle is what we have learned about the human body over the last four or five But shown on the far left and the far right is a description given to us at a time when we knew so little about the human body. But we understood it, we sensed something, and we visualized something. And the people who visualized this described something they could feel in their body. The body was used as the experiment. And it's described with great elegance in our yoga texts by practitioners who are there today who can teach you all these things. And somewhere there is a message that language sometimes powers and powers, but also imprisons. I'll finish off here with this quote, which translates into measure what is measurable tools improve, um, systems change, and render measurable in time what as yet is not. The 70th anniversary of the discovery of the structure of DNA is this year. Before, we had no idea what was DNA and what the structure, we knew what was DNA, but we didn't know what the structure was. And just by understanding that structure, which in a way is a language, structure is a language, that structure helped us take the leap to understand why there was a ratio, a mysterious ratio of the purines to the pyrimidines from the world of chemistry. It was with us for decades at that time in 1953 that if you look at any DNA, the ratio of purines to pyrimidines would always be constant, but nobody could explain this. But the moment we saw the double helix and how there was only so much space between the bases, where you could stack purine with a pyrimidine in a certain way, only that was the permitted way of arrangement of those chemicals. A whole new language opened up for us. So, I leave it here. I thank all of you in Hyderabad for having me with you people today, uh, challenging me with this task of trying to see how we can connect language 
in that understanding with contemporary needs and where we might be based on the best of what is in the past. Thank you, Ji. Thank you, Professor, for a very thought-provoking and interesting lecture. You have highlighted the difficulties in correlating Ayurvedic fundamentals, for instance, Rotas and Rasa Panchaka, Ama, etc., with their connects in cell biology. You have also in, in, emphasized the importance of understanding language with respect to Atindriya, Sukshmatva, and Paramanatva. And uh, here, uh, it just reminds me of uh, uh, Charaka's uh, 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 Sutra Sthana Shloka, which says, Pratyaksham hi alpam, analpam apratyaksham asti, yat agama anumana yuktibhir upalabhyate. So Ayurveda has have has had not just uh, 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 you know um, acquiring knowledge through pratyaksha, but it uh, it also has a, the agama upama inference and also logical reasoning. So these must have been the reasons why there is uh, still a disconnect between um, the two sciences. And uh, uh, this uh, this is indeed paradoxical. Uh, but you, I we greatly appreciate you for charting the way forward. And uh, since you see, and I was mightily impressed with your knowledge in Ayurveda and the way you have expressed all of this, I now invite the audience to um, pose their questions to the uh, professor himself. So we invite the questions from the audience now. I think the professor Sharat Arandamurti has asked a question. Yes, sir. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, 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 Professor Madan, uh, I really am so inspired by, you know, so many things you said, but uh, I may have misunderstood uh, something which is uh, perhaps not central because you made this point much early on in your talk where you showed us the, uh, the medicine which is used for uh, overcoming di digestive problems and uh, showed the slide where the uh, elaborate biochemistry of that is, uh, is given. Now here's, I think, a problem in uh, making that kind of translation because aren't you somewhere essentially um, uh, reducing a system of uh, practice and thought to saying, hey, look, I mean, these are all things that we knew much earlier, but this is uh, uh, what, uh, you know, these guys with uh, their sophisticated uh, biochemistry and molecular biology are stumbling upon. Uh, I think in doing that, aren't we doing a little disservice to a very different system of health, thought, and practice? And I had a second question. I'm just reading out uh, what I wrote to you, sir. Uh, is the kind of a, in the struggle between paradigm, um, in the West, there's a, there's a well laid out history. Of course, you may say that it's a very prejudiced history of looking at only one uh, uh, set of cultures, but nonetheless, there is. And then we see it as a clash of various various ideas. Whereas, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, Ayurvedic system, as we, as you so beautifully uh, uh, pointed out some remarkable things, comes more like a revealed knowledge, you know, or at least it's presented as such. I'm sure there is a, a very well-developed history of that as well. But we don't see the narrative of that. And I think it's unless these are elaborated uh, dialogue between Western science and uh, modern uh, biochemistry and uh, the Ayurveda uh, may not yield much fruit. I would like your comment. Thank you, sir. You are a, thank you, sir. You are a man of physics and... Uh, yes, yes, sir. I'm a professor here. That's in right. I, I can see you are a man of physics, yeah, so yeah. you are phrasing things very correctly. I'm going to use the phrase called holistic reductionism right. and a second concept that is important for us to understand that physicists grapple with is simultaneity and 
simultaneity is something we are uncomfortable about. You know? Right. And so unless we come to terms with those two issues, then we will see a divide. Now, for us in India, for some reason, the Indian mind has a plasticity and has degrees of freedom that helps it accommodate these two issues that make Western thinking different from Eastern thinking. Yeah, I agree. And, yeah. Yeah. Simpson. Brian is very special to us because he showed that you can get electrons to tunnel through a barrier. And nobody believed it. Right. And he said, this is the mathematics. This is how it works. And he was only a second year undergraduate when he showed this. Because he was sitting in a lecture by Anderson and he was talking about Cooper pairs and all these things. And he could see straight away, intuitively, right. that it is possible for an electron to tunnel a barrier. Right. So there are spaces in Western thinking where they have broken those uh, kind of limits, which is natural for us in our Vedic systems. Because we accept Advaita Vedanta, for instance, you know, right. Adi Shankara tells us you've got to put the entirety together. Okay, now he traps all the other darshanas there. He traps Sankhya. Sankhya talks Sankhya has a beginning that tends towards particles and individuals and uh, timelines and uh, moving away from simultaneity. And this battle between Sankhya and Vedanta, Advaita. So there is a battle there that is already in our, in our uh, community in India. We don't have a right. difficulty with that. And we achieve that using the concept of holistic reductionism. Right. And that is a strange term for people, but for us it's not. And let me elaborate on what I mean by holistic reductionism. So when we have a concept of Panjabhut, when we understand the five Bhutas, we are not, for each one of the Bhutas, we are not excluding the four other Bhutas. They are also part of that Bhuta. Right. Because that is how we arrive at that thinking. We say everything exists together and they are all in operation simultaneously. Now, as soon as we say that, the experimentalist is lost. Because the experimentalist wants to isolate things. That's right. Which is fine. But if you keep isolating, you will come up to that Heisenberg kind of uncertainty principle. All right. The point that we want to say here is even in biology there is uncertainty right and we are not pushing our physicists and bio if you start measuring biological process at the kind of resolution at single cell resolution and at subcellular resolution you see straight away that Many concepts in biology are beyond our reach. We have right. to model them differently. I talked about cancer, the origins of cancer. We will never, there's a gray area. We will never understand that area because the nature of that every cell has a quantum mystery within it. It's a, it's a true quantum, quantum computing right. system. Right. It is processing such a vast amount of information in parallel. There is infinite redundancy in the system. There is infinite right. degrees of freedom there. And I can give you, for those in the biology area, if there may be some people listening to this uh, coming from biology. I do, now that you've raised this, I just want to press that point hard so that we give people a different impression of how we understand biological system using the Vedic logic of simultaneity and uh, about holistic reductionism. I'm going to uh, excuse me for a few minutes while I go into the details, but these are very, very easy to understand. If you take look at the human genome, I'm going to give a genome, human genome perspective, and I can do uh, three or four areas, which is very, very easy to understand, very important to see what I mean by holistic reduction. Independently. 
So every cell in our body is working independently. It is eternally dynamic. At many, many levels, it is dynamic. Dynamic at the level of calcium flux. It is dynamic at the level of protein turnover. It's dynamic at the level of gene expression, etc. We will never be able to model it. And the moment you try to model it and you open a cell up because you want to do a measurement, you're killing the cell. There's no way out of it. You don't know the trajectory of that cell the moment you kill it. So we have a way in which we have appreciated that difficulty, perhaps not at the level of the cell, maybe at the level of Deha Paramanu, but we have appreciated it at the level of the whole body. And we've come up with a framework that is based on holistically reduced parameters. And we call it the Panjabhutas. And we show how these Panjabhutas interact to give which nobody accepts, even people in our uh, land in India, they don't accept. But the yogis say we do this and it gives us special energy. We manage hypertension, we manage the immune system, we manage all of these things by controlling our breath work. And we have so many different ways to do pranayama. So, and that logic of understanding breath work and pranayama comes from a slightly different framework. So there is, in my mind, uh, uh, Professor Sharath, I don't see a conflict. If we stay true to our framework and the way we are meant to appreciate, if we deviate even a very small amount away from Adi Shankara's Advait Vedanta or uh, uh, Sankhya, Kapilamuni's Sankhya, and if we don't use the logic of Vaisheshika and Nyaya and Mimamsa, then we are lost. So I, I, when we yeah, talk about, right. if you see what I mean, so we have to keep it all together and then we will, we will be able to explain to the world. And then we'll be able to go into any cell biology experiment and tell them, by the way, this is where you should go because we've right. reached a point in that we accumulated so much data today, churn, you know, when I did my PhD, I could sequence one gene and half of a second gene. Right. And it was a struggle. Today, you prepare DNA, you send it to a company. So that's the scale at which we are generating right. information. Yes. But we I don't know how to handle that information. Right. So in a, in a way, what you're saying, sir, is that uh, some of them have to start the journey towards these systems rather than the other way around. Absolutely. Yeah. And right. the other point, right. and I, 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 now that you've opened up that um, right. uh, bag, right. what I want to say is that if we push our story just a little more, we will suddenly find that we become the global leaders in that thinking. And this is an opportunity we should not miss. And this would be very much like Infosys ruling the world or TCS ruling the world. We want to develop a narrative that highlights these key points. The world, the, the universe, the earth and its workings. And training a set of students to think that way. and show how we bring in the best of mathematics and physics and uh, biology together as an as a amalgam in a transdisciplinary way that enables the growth of a whole new style of thinking, which is no different from what we were meant to have based on what we have, uh, the system, this kind of thinking that we should have uh, followed through, but somehow we got lost somewhere in the way. And I think we look forward to leaders like yourself, President Sarna, uh, that um, we want to accommodate um, and, and grow that space where we can have these kind of dialogues with examples and opportunities for the future, for, you, shaping, for shaping things for the future. And we look forward to having University of Hyderabad taking that leadership role 
where we make these dialogues happen, where we can enthuse not only the state government. You know, I, the example I give uh, 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 is Microsoft Research. Microsoft Research has a few campuses, few activities around the world. And Hyderabad is one of those places where Microsoft Research has a campus. I think there are four Microsoft Research campuses in the world. Hyderabad is one. And there's a reason why they chose Hyderabad, for whatever reason. Hyderabad has, for instance, you no know, potential rule. And we must look at our strengths. National Institute of Nutrition is in Hyderabad. The story of NIN is a global, a, 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 an amazing story. Uh, when we look at the history of NIN, it was set up by an uh, uh, English uh, doctor who worked for the Indian military service, uh, Sir Robert McCarrison. And he was the first person in the world to show what he called deficiency diseases, creativity at its best. He was working in Gilgit and he showed there was a connection between iodine, lack of iodine and goiter. And he ruled a certain kind of thinking that came out from India. And in his memory, now we have the NIN in Hyderabad. And that is what Ayurveda is all about. Ayurveda is about nutrition. It's about understanding the land. It's talking about the um, desha and the kala in a, in a very elegant, holistic way. And we, that language must come comfortably to us as well as the reductionist, the power of the reductionist thinking. Right. So reductionism can be reductionist, reductionist, or holistic reductionist. So let us keep that as a way to Thank you. how I look at this problem. Thank you for your question. Thank I you. hope I could, I hope I could convey. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. But I have to rush off. So well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you for being much. with us today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for such an insightful question and an equally insightful answer, sir. Uh, we have Gayatri Ramachandran, madam, I, with, uh, she, uh, you know, she, uh, I invite her to ask her question. It seems to be very interesting. She wants to know if uh, there is a scope to apply Ayurveda to genetic counseling as well. Madam, are you available? Yes, ma'am. Please, ma yeah, please, please go ahead. Yes. Hello. Gayatri, Ji, Namaskar. Namaskar. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the School of Life Sciences, University of Hyderabad. Um, so I, I love how you brought out the analogy of intelligence and the mitochondria. And uh, basically, you, you strung philosophy into science, which was wonderful. Uh, so what I wish to ask is uh, whether genetic counseling was uh, applied uh, in Ayurveda, of course, you said you did mention that uh, genetic diseases did not exist in the concept of Ayurveda. Um, DNA and epigenetics wasn't there. But um, do you see uh, with genetic counseling now uh, taking shape along with uh, allopathy? Do you see um, Ayurveda and genetic counseling going together? How do you think you can apply it? Thank you, Gayatri, for this wonderful question. Now, you have raised um, a very interesting and very important and a very timely question. Now, in uh, LB Nagar in uh, Hyderabad, you have the Kaminini hospitals, you know. Right. right. And in um, the Kaminini hospital, there is a team that's been working. Aini right. Hassan is uh, the genetic counselor. Perhaps counselor. you know Aini and... Um, you know the work that's going on. So Aini is doing some of this work, but she comes to it from the modern biology area. So that's right. one thing. So it's Hyderabad, something is happening. Now, the second thing I want to touch on, again, Hyderabad-based, um, is uh, Professor Tangaraj in CC. CDFB now, yeah. I'm assuming he's still there. And he's at CDFB now. It's, sorry, what's it called, Gatri? She's at CDFD now. CDFD, okay. Anyway, yeah. Tung, uh, 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 Dr. Tangaraj's work on uh, uh, tropomyosin mutation mm -hmm. and uh, certain cardiac diseases. Right. Now, this is something, again, this fusion between the best of contemporary biology and the best of Ayurveda. Now, uh, Dr. Tangaraj has shown how there is a prevalence of a certain allelic uh, 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 deletion, a small deletion. I think it's in one of the introns and in one of the tropomyosin genes that 
destabilizes mm -hmm. the expression of uh, tropomyosin. And it gives rise, there's a connection between this mutation and mm -hmm. incidence of certain cardiac uh, diseases. Uh, you, right. you, you'll be easy, it'll be easy to find that. Now, he leaves the story there, and your question mm -hmm. provides the link to what Ayurveda can offer those patients. So there is a high incidence of certain diseases. Mm -hmm. We know now with uh, genetic markers, and we can track that easily. What can Ayurveda do? Ayurveda can provide a kind of guidance to those people who are carriers. So number one, Aini Hassan can take the mutation that uh, Professor Tangaraj has done, and mm -hmm. she can detect this in people. And when it comes to counseling, she can provide guidance for those patients, which can be inspired by Ayurveda. Right. So that is one A. Two, uh, muscular dystrophy. There are teams, again, in Hyderabad who are working on this area, who know all about the mutations, the Indian mutations, etc., mm -hmm. but are not able to guide the patient, guide the individual. So number one, genetic counseling, uh, uh, prenatal diagnosis to avoid number two so that was not known in Ayurveda uh, mm -hmm. this is a new tool new addition to Ayurvedic thinking and adding to that if a child is born then what can Ayurveda do to manage the health of certain tissues uh, the muscle tissue or the neuromuscular tissue and there are many things that Ayurveda talks about, certain Rasayanas that will help improve the status. Autism is another big area where we now know that the gut microbes, there's, the gut microbiome has in autistic children is of a slightly different profile compared to normal children. Okay. And sometimes there are almost a, a situation where we feel the reason for Certain bacteria that mm -hmm. cause some kind of demyelination in some in a subset of autistic children. So the moment we reach some of these kind of links, that is beyond Ayurveda. Ayurveda doesn't know about. It just uses a concept, a, a, a wide concept called krimis. Uh, um, it uses the whole concept of. Approximately, which approximately microbes could also okay. include other organisms there. And they use the concept of Shahajakrimi, the mm -hmm. friendly organisms that live with us. If there is a dysbiosis there, it then, like I talked about the nasal microbiome, there is a problem. And that can be corrected and perhaps might even be manageable using Ayurvedic diet, a way in which you manage. Uh, uh, Dr. Vaidya Prasad in Kerala has a very mm -hmm. large program mm -hmm. in his center for autism, looking at some of these things. There is a dialogue going on there between some Siddha work, uh, researchers and Ayurveda. But we haven't brought in that microbiome aspect yet because it's still early days. We are still mm -hmm. understanding those pro-inflammatory bacteria and anti-inflammatory bacteria. But in reply to your question, I've given you, I hope I've given you a few examples, starting with Aini Hassan and Kamenini Hospital. Right. CCMB, Professor Tangaraj, and the work on uh, the tropomyosin mutations and yeah. how we might be able to understand that better. And also in terms of autism and yeah. the links that can be made between National Institute of Nutrition, Ayurveda, Department of Sanskrit, CCMB. These are all incredible links that cannot happen anywhere in the world. I it can see. only happen in Hyderabad. Absolutely. So there you are, Gayatri. You are in a very privileged position to be in uh, Hyderabad and to be in an environment where you have an opportunity to make all this, bring all this together and make it happen. Absolutely, sir. I'm really blessed to be associated with uh, the Sanskrit Studies Department through these programs. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you for asking this question. Thank you so much. And let us be in touch. Sure, sure. Thank you, Gayatri, for joining. And we appreciate your uh, uh, patience and your, and also the question that you have posed is extremely so relevant. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir, again. Thank you, Madan, sir. And, Thank you. Uh, 
anybody any more do we have time or shall we actually uh, i can see uh, yes uh, vinay ji i can see bishnu priya ji joining yes, from goa yes ah. sir i don't know yes, bishnu ji yes very very nice message she has put here sir it's all the subtle ways how best ayurveda could be distilled oh ah uh, vishnu vishnu priya uh, this madam are you available could you madam, uh, would you like to interact with uh, sir what uh, the your impression of the lecture thanks for joining yeah ye namaste vishnu priya ji namaskar ji ji uh, it's actually a very uh, na you are really kind enough that you are extending your helping hand to the organizations of ayurveda and putting our science into a biggest platform where the global citizens is watching for the implementations of ayurveda and uh, hope no 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 such export in my vision from the subject of ayurveda is still commanding enough to praise in the science in such a fascinating way so what i am looking for i knew you uh, but uh, uh, day by day i am i am getting something more insights uh, how you are looking into the science so even though you are not uh, uh, from the subject of ayurveda but you are a great icon to take ayurveda for its finest presentations thank you so much sir uh, and and i i don't know uh, how far i can implement or connect to the sanghita's principles uh, but i feel that uh, so much to do thank you once again thank you madam any questions or shall we move on to the vote of thanks dr anjane murthy sir is there he is a senior most ah, 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 yes. from karnataka ah. he worked as the director of aish karnataka state probably are you available sir uh, can you please uh, unmute and uh, talk say few words it is the most uh, wonderful lecture i have heard i thank the um, people for organizing um, it is a eye opener for the ayurvedic people i will call it as a symbiosis between the all systems so we are towards the progress we are towards understanding the things that our acharyas have described thank you very much thank you sir for joining any 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 questions any further questions i request our professor and head of department professor jsr prasad sir to kindly deliver the vote of thanks i deem it a great privilege to propose uh, this vote of thanks for this wonderful lecture by professor madan tangaveelu ji there is a uh, wonderful version jaraka samhita ekam shastram adhiyano navidya shastra nischayam tasmat bahushrata shastram vijaniya chikitsaka so uh, these days we have replaced this word chikitsaka by samshodaka any researcher not necessarily a doctor because uh, these are universal uh, principles uh, proposed in the samhitas so uh, as uh, professor vishnupriya ji rightly mentioned we are seeing uh, such an interesting scholar in professor madan tangaveelu ji unless we join hands and do a team work and produce uh, more results as he spoke elaborately uh, from the language perspective he is uh, 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 referring to uh shivakshara uh, pachana churna how we miss uh, uh, the actual point that is hidden in the language because it is meant for pitta and vata and uh, it is something is hidden people normally don't understand what they mean that example is has given uh, one of the few examples that has given from the language uh, perspective as part of is an abstract which is already mentioned how the things are covered in linguistic uh, dimension and second thing is about uh, ayurvedic uh, introduction to biologists he has mentioned uh, herbert uh, frolic uh, as example and uh, he has elaborate talked about the example from ratacharya so how uh, the the uh, gene expressions uh, based on ratacharya are different and the papers that uh, whatever uh, published so far that has referred uh, very correctly and also i liked uh, his uh, uh, i think is like a statement or slogan biology to uh, ayurvedic biology to ayush biology that was really very nice because ayurvedic biology is in a limited sense we are talking 
which has been popularized for the last uh, one decade or so and then government of india has done something in this direction but now i think uh, we need to move further as uh, respected anjane murthy ji uh, mentioned uh, definitely uh, we are going to put in more efforts towards this uh, progression and uh, i i really appreciate uh, the kind of patience that he maintained throughout the lecture initially we thought for uh, for some time see uh, he is in cambridge and it is midnight for him but still he is able to uh, you know uh, uh, patiently answering the questions and uh, perfectly given the answers you know uh, i i appreciate uh, the questioners also for bringing different uh, uh, perspectives in the questions and uh, which are rightly answered by professor madan tangeveli ji we look forward to you sir we need your guidance thank you thank you very much uh, uh, i cannot express uh, uh, in in words the gratitude that we need to show to you and uh, we look forward for uh, future interactions with you from our institution and also across the country few more institutions are there where you are also part and parcel of their collaborations so we are here uh, for any assistance and look forward for your guidance thanks a lot for your wonderful lecture sir thank you very much thank you ji and uh, i also thank uh, uh, professor uh, sharath ji uh, from our own university for uh, posing a wonderful question which went on for a, a, an elaborate discussion uh, clarifying many many you know confusions that is excellent and also ms gayatri uh, a research scholar from the university uh, for asking another wonderful question and anjane murthy garu patiently was here for the last two hours uh, is one of the most respected uh, scholars in india here and also the initially who joined uh, dr uh, uh, k murali sir uh, and professor k mutlakshmi professor aloka professor amba professor veera padhi and um, others who joined uh, uh, to make this uh, lecture successful we look forward for your uh, participation in the future lectures also and uh, with this uh, few words i would like to thank uh, once again uh, Uh, today's speaker, Professor uh, 